Hello and welcome to the West Asia Post. I am Redi Francis and over the next half hour I will get you all the latest updates, stories, news from this region that I call my home, West Asia. Starting from the Arab Gulf. When we say the Arab Gulf, the first thing that comes to your mind are oil-rich countries. Well, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates are running a tough race to become the ultimate entertainment and tourism hubs. These countries are trying to cut down their dependence on oil and energy and rather implement money into tourism, sports and entertainment. Follow the next report. Star-studded Joy Awards. Atlantis the Royal Hotel's grand opening ceremony. Iconic Dakar Rally. Dubai's popular New Year fireworks. Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates. These two Arab countries are going all out to divert focus from oil and energy to sports and entertainment. From sports championships to award shows to grand destination opening ceremonies, the governments of UAE and Saudi Arabia are spending money on many such events to attract tourists. Starting from star-studded Joy Awards in Riyadh, the kingdom hosted Arab and international artists, directors, athletes, and social media influencers for the grand event. Riyadh's new star footballer Cristiano Ronaldo's girlfriend Georgina Rodriguez was the most talked about celebrity on the show. Rodriguez's attire, which seemed to be honoring the region, became the talk of the town. Another star-studded event was hosted by Saudi's neighbor, United Arab Emirates. Dubai, too, witnessed a glamorous evening with over 1,000 celebrities from across the globe. These celebrities had gathered for its luxury hotel, Atlantis the Royals opening ceremony. Music superstar Beyonce performed to mark the lavish event. Her 60-minute performance was her first live show since 2018. The performance was followed by fireworks and a drone extravaganza. Other special guests included American model Kendall Jenner, English singer Lyanne Pine and Indian actor Disha Patani. The hotel, which was eight years in the making, has been branded as the world's most ultra-luxury resort. So you know Dubai is really, really a global destination that attracts people from, along, from all around the world. 2022 has been an exceptional year from the tourist industry. And then we really, really believing on the future of the destination Dubai. This Atlantis the Royal will redefine the destinations along the way. It's not just luxury and entertainment that are witnessing money flow into the Arab states. Sports too have become a key focus area in recent years. Saudi Arabia hosted the iconic Dakar Rally. It is the flagship of the five-round FIA World Rally Raid Championship. Five points are available for each stage win, as well as points for the overall classification at the finish. Qatar's Nasser Al Atiyah won the Dakar Rally car crown for the fifth time. While Argentine KTM rider Kevin Benavides triumphed on two wheels to take his second title in Saudi Arabia. 
I'm really so happy, you know. Thank for Matthew, thank for the team, and thank for all the sponsor, you know. Uh, it was uh, really a tough uh, Dakar for everybody, but okay, we manage and we to win again, you know, in row. It's really uh, it's amazing, you know, to defend our title, you know. Both Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates are trying to boost tourism and reject their image of being nations that are driven solely by oil and energy trade. Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has even announced the launch of an events investment fund. The money will be used to develop a sustainable infrastructure for the culture, tourism, entertainment and sport sectors. The creation of the fund aims to position the kingdom as a global hub for such activities. Bureau Report, we on World is One. Before moving forward, let's take a look at what else is making the headlines across West Asia. Turkey's top court rejects a Kurdish-backed opposition party's request to defer a trial that could lead to its dissolution until after May elections. The decision can bar Turkey's third largest party from taking part in the May 14 polls. Hundreds gather outside Lebanon's Justice Palace to protest stalled 2020 Beirut port explosion probe after top judges cancelled meet to discuss the fate of the inquiry. Bahrain's Crown Prince and Qatari Emir hold telephonic talks, signalling that the two Gulf states could repair ties two years after lifting regional boycott of Qatar. Bahraini state media confirmed the development. An Israeli raid on the occupied West Bank's Jenin refugee camp kills nine Palestinians, including an elderly woman, claim Palestinian officials. Palestine also accuses the forces of using tear gas inside a hospital children's ward. Israel and the US hold one of their biggest joint military exercises over Israel and East Mediterranean. The war games involving over 7,000 military personnel are seen as a message to Iran amid growing tensions over Tehran's nuclear program. And Iran imposes sanctions on 34 individuals and entities from the European Union and Britain in reaction to similar measures taken over Tehran's response to months-long protests. And now shifting the focus to the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Now Benjamin Netanyahu is trying to make peace with Jordan. This is after his security minister's Al-Aqsa visit. But Bin Gavir's explosive remarks threaten to spike tensions again in the region. Now that's not all what Benjamin Netanyahu has to deal with. He's facing protests. Thousands are protesting against his government's proposed judiciary reforms. We tell you more in this report. A surprise visit by the Israeli Prime Minister to meet the King of Jordan in Amman only became public after this tweet. Meeting with King Abdullah marks Netanyahu's first foreign trip since he came back to power. Netanyahu's Jordan visit could be seen as an effort to make peace with its neighbors. Israeli Prime Minister's office claimed that Netanyahu was in Jordan to discuss regional ties. However, the royal court claimed that the king told Netanyahu that Israel should respect the status quo of Jerusalem's holy Al-Aqsa Mosque. <laughs> this after far-right Israeli National Security Minister Itamir ben Giver visited the mosque compound on the 3rd of January. <laughs> Jews revere Al-Aqsa as the Temple Mount. The compound is also Islam's third holiest site after Mecca and Medina. Ben Giver's visit caused a massive outrage among Palestinians and the Arab states. What's added to the furor is Ben Giver's latest remarks. The Israeli minister said he will continue to visit the holy site, further adding that he manages his own policy concerning the Temple Mount and not that of the Jordanian government. 
then give her contentious remarks may overshadow Netanyahu's efforts to ease the situation. The Israeli minister's statement could increase the tensions in the region. The fears of ultra-right policies sparking a new cycle of violence are already rife ever since Netanyahu returned to power. Jordan fears provocative moves by the ultra-right Jewish groups who perform prayers in the compound of Al-Aqsa. Muslims consider the compound a part of the mosque. Jordan says any changes in policy would undermine a years-old arrangement in which Jews and non-Muslims are permitted to visit but are not allowed to pray. A miffed neighbor is not the only challenge Netanyahu is facing. Israel is also witnessing massive unrest over government's bid to overhaul judicial system. The protesters have been staging demonstrations in different parts of the country to oppose the new legal reforms. On the 24th of January, the protesters chanting democracy blocked a main road in Tel Aviv. Yes, I do. I am concerned that in the future investments will drop if uh, this uh, law will pass and that um, it will be very hard to maintain the large high-tech uh, and flourishing sector um, as it is right now. On the other hand, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is steadfast in his stance. He dismissed the demonstrations as a refusal by leftists to accept the results of last November's election. The Israeli leader said that the proposed plan would bolster the economy. In recent days, I've been hearing concerns regarding the impact of the judicial reform on our economic resilience. Here, too, I would like to set the record straight. The exact opposite is true. Not only do our moves to strengthen the democracy in Israel not hurt the economy, they will strengthen it. Netanyahu's rebuttal comes at a time when leading Israeli economists warned that the judicial shakeup would cause unprecedented damage to the economy. According to reports, over 250 top economists, including former central bank officials, expressed their concern. They said weakening the judiciary will lead to long-term damage to the economy's growth trajectory and the quality of life for Israel's residents. Israel's judicial reforms are yet to be written into law. The reforms would tighten political control over judicial appointments. They will also limit the Supreme Court's powers to overturn government decisions or Knesset laws. Bureau report, we are World is One. And now to Lebanon, the country I'm currently standing in. Well, the citizens of Lebanon have hit the streets once again. After protesting for the 2020 Beirut port blast, they descended to the streets because of anguish and anger over the devaluation once again of the Lebanese currency. Now the lira has lost more than 97% of its value. Here's a report. <laughs> Angry citizens hit the streets, burning tires, holding local currency bills. Protesters are furious over the spiraling devaluation of the Lebanese currency, Lira. Demonstrations led to street closures in Beirut as protesters threw rocks at the central bank. The economic crisis has deepened so much that the citizens have to pay around 100,000 liras to buy 250 grams of wheat. I used to use these 16,000 Lebanese lira to buy a kilo of meat for me and my kids. Now they don't even get me chewing gum. The 250 grams of meat cost 100,000 Lebanese lira. Fear God, our kids are hungry, we are hungry. Drop the dollar, we want to live. Have mercy on us. Petrol prices have skyrocketed to over a million Lebanese pounds for a 20-litre tank, a price that is unaffordable for many. Citizens blame the government for this grim economic scenario. The decline in the lira has been particularly steep in January. Its value dropped from 42,000 Lebanese lira per dollar to a new low of 56,000 per dollar this week. 
Lebanon's economic meltdown began in 2019. It has cost the lira around 97% of its value. The economic crisis worsened after the 2020 Beirut blast. The August 4 blast killed 220 people and injured 6,000. The explosion displaced over 300,000 people and crippled an already slumping economy. The probe was mired in corruption and got stalled. It pointed fingers at several senior leaders and officials. Last week, the families of victims gathered outside Beirut Justice Palace to demand justice. After the stir, Judge Tariq Bitar unexpectedly resumed his probe into the explosion case. His probe was paralyzed for more than a year due to political resistance. Bitar also faced legal complaints filed by top officials he was seeking to question. He charged Lebanon's top public prosecutor, the then Premier and other senior current and former officials in connection with the devastating explosion. According to reports, Lebanon's Prosecutor General Ghassan Ovidat sent Bitar an official letter. Ovidat, who is also one of the accused, said that the blast probe remained suspended. The Prosecutor General further said no official decision was taken on the resumption of the investigation. Analysts claim that deferring opinions within the judiciary could mean that some of the decisions could go unimplemented. <laughs> Bitar's previous efforts to interrogate top officials have been hindered by factions, including the Iran-backed Hezbollah group. They even campaigned against Bitar and also accused Washington of meddling in the probe. However, the U.S. ambassador has denied the accusation. In a tweet, the U.S. embassy said that they want a swift and transparent probe. The explosion on August 4, 2020 at Beirut port was caused by hundreds of tons of ammonium nitrate. The chemical was stored in poor conditions since it was unloaded in 2013. So far, no senior official has been held accountable for the negligence and the deadly blast. And now to Turkey. Well, Turkey has rescheduled its elections, preponing it by a month. Experts claim that this is to woo conservative electorate. Our next report brings you all the details. Turkey has advanced its elections by almost a month. <laughs> Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has announced that elections will be held on May 14. The President's office released video footage of Erdogan announcing the date at a meeting with young voters in the northwestern province of Bursa. I am grateful to God that we will be walking side by side with you, our first time voting youth, in the elections that will be held on May 14th. As the president, we are going to use our authority to start the electoral calendar and there will be a duration of 60 days which will be processed by the high electoral board. Turkey's general election was due on June 18th. Erdogan said that the adjustments were made to avoid disrupting the school exam schedules a move that was meant to align with the ruling party's junior right-wing coalition partner. Meanwhile, the opposition is still in search of a common candidate to be fielded against Erdogan. They have been trying for months to agree on a single candidate. The election campaign is due to start on March 10th. This would give the opposition even less time to prepare. Reports suggest that the parties are likely to zero in on a name by February. Istanbul's popular opposition mayor, Ekrem Imamoglu, is a favorite in opinion polls. The Istanbul mayor had put an end to the domination of Erdogan's ruling party in the 2019 local elections. 
An Istanbul court had last month banned the 52-year-old from politics, but he has appealed and can technically run for president. The opposition's internal disagreements could play to Erdogan's advantage. This year's election could prove to be the most challenging in Erdogan's 20-year rule, as Turkey's high inflation and weakening currency could help the opposition cause. The country has witnessed economic booms, giant development projects, disputes with neighbors, wars and a failed coup in recent years. Erdogan came to power in 2003, first as prime minister and then president. Since then, he has embarked on an ambitious infrastructure program, building tunnels, bridges and the country's largest airport. Erdogan's subsequent crackdown on opponents and uneasy relations with NATO allies have raised questions about Turkey's future direction under his rule. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. Back to the Gulf again, this time to Sultanate Oman. Oman has witnessed snowfall this year. Yes, you heard me right. Well, it is a rare phenomenon as snow blanketed its Jabal -e Shams mountains. Videos of local residents enjoying this rare phenomenon surfaced all over the social media. Take a look. We are currently traveling to Jabal Shams in Oman and the view describes itself. It is cold but I have my jacket. Come see here. This is wonderful. That's all from my side for this week and this episode of the West Asia Post. I will see you next week in the same time, bringing you more interesting stories from the region that is called the most volatile region in the world. Until then, stay safe. I am Ghadi Francis coming to you from Beirut, Lebanon. Keep on watching. We on. World is one. <laughs>